Welcome back to part two of the following bust monument series. We got a lot of ground to cover in this video, so I think we're just gonna get started. Yeah, we should get started. Jumping right in, I'm going to tackle waterproofing the pillar, since it's made of a cardboard tube meant for use with concrete. To do this, I'm going to coat it in Plasti Dip. This will help to create a rubber-like coating over the pillar and should be our best line of defense to keep the moisture out of our monument. Once the top is coated, I allowed it to dry and followed it up with a second coat, using a chip brush to help push it into all the hard to reach spaces, and then set it out in the sun to cure. The next part of the build that I need to tackle is the addition of a few pieces of foam to mount our LED strip light on. I'll glue them in place with Gorilla Glue and give them time to set up before installing the lights. While we wait, I'm going to use some caulking to seal all the gaps around the outside of the monument. This helps hide any seam lines or skewer marks in the foam. Once the caulk was dry, it was time to base coat the entire piece with Drylock Original. First with a messy coat, and then a second, more textured coat. I discussed my method of Drylock application in our Tombstone video. So if you haven't seen it yet, be sure to check it out. While I waited for the dry lock to cure, I had a conversation with Mrs. Van Oaks, who suggested the addition of some broken chunks of stone on top of the pillar since it wouldn't have broken off at a perfectly flat 45 degree angle naturally. So I grabbed some offcuts of foam and broke them into pieces before gluing them to the top, followed by some sculpting with an X-Acto knife and a rasp. Then I forgot to press record. To help make the surface even more chunky, I used some of the foam bits from inside my shop vac and applied them between the larger chunks of foam with caulk as the adhesive. Then it was a final coat of dry lock to seal in the new additions, and after a brief drying period, it was time for paint. First up is an off-white base coat that I'll be spraying on with my critter gun. This paint was a mix of white with a little yellow ochre and black. The next part of this paint job will be to break up the base color with a speckle coat. I'm taking some of my leftover base color that I've added some burnt umber to and I'll be using a long handled paintbrush and a piece of PVC pipe to tap against to create small to medium sized speckles. This can take some practice, so as a rule of thumb I always start on the back side of the prop. Anywhere that the paint has gone on too heavy or there are runs, I'll feather them out with the brush, followed by a damp sea sponge. This will help to create sort of a marbled appearance. This wasn't part of my original idea, but sometimes the prop tells you how they want to be finished, and it's a good idea to listen. When the entire base is painted, I'll switch over to my airbrush to add in some marble veins with a darker brownish gray color. To get really thin lines, it's important to keep your air pressure low and your airbrush close to the surface. This definitely takes some practice.
After adding the marbling to the entire base, I sprayed some of the same color I used for the veins to give it more variation and to soften some of the lines. Then I followed it up to some of the off-white base color to soften the paint even more. Then it was on to weathering. I mixed up some burnt umber, black, and yellow ochre paint and added it to my spray bottle with water and started spraying down the entire monument. Okay, I'm gonna break in right here to kind of come clean on something. The weathering is too heavy. There, I said it. I typically think that you can go a little bit heavier on your weathering because it's gotta read well in the dark. But with this, you know, after doing all of the uh, sort of concrete uh, granite look by tapping the paintbrush to create the speckles, and all that airbrush work, it really is just washed out completely by the weathering on this. And not to say that I'm unhappy with the finished product, I think it looks great, but is it exactly what I was hoping for? Not really. Anyhow, just know that even when you go in with a plan, sometimes that plan can get thwarted by being a bit more aggressive than you normally would think to be. Anyhow, now back to our regularly scheduled program. I tried to lessen the weathering by spraying down the monument with water, but it wasn't quite enough to restore the paint back to its pre-weathering state. Now that the paint is out of the way, I can get the lights installed for our staring statue. The trick to lighting these effectively is to mirror the existing lighting in the space. For typical overhead lighting, you can either place the lights in the back side above the statue, allowing the light to shine through the plastic, or from below on the viewer's side, which hits the same normal high points. Experiment in your space to see what gives the best effect. For my setup, I'm using an adhesive-backed LED strip light in a warm white color. It can be plugged into a battery bank or a standard outlet since it's got a USB connection. A bit of hot glue to ensure a strong connection to the foam, and then we can install our bust in the same way. Now I've been staring at this monument for just over a week and I kept thinking it needed a little something. So I grabbed some fake ivy from the craft store and after cutting off some long pieces, I started affixing them around the pillar, adding hot glue to the backs of the leaves since it's the least visible and the biggest gluing surface. And with that, it was done. All right, well, that's gonna do it for this one. Special thank you to Jasper Anderson over at chickenprops.com for supplying me with the Staring Statues bust for this project. If you want, you can go over to his website right now and get a set for yourself. Anyhow, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. And most importantly, go make something.